Hi everybody and welcome to Mr. Farmer's AP Macroeconomics. Today we're going to continue talking about the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, mostly about how it kind of all starts the banking system and we're going to go through the creation of a bank to help us explain some of these things um, like liabilities and assets and reserve requirements uh, and those different kinds of things. Now some things to think about, and if you aren't sure what the answers are, maybe watch the other video, the old one, 12.2. What do the Federal Open Market Committee do? Okay, what's it going on there, and why is that important? What do the 12 Federal Reserve Banks do? And then also, why did Congress decide to have the Federal Reserve Bank be independent uh, versus a public voted in office uh, type question? So today, again, we're talking about the Factual Reserve System, the creation of a single bank in order to use that to extrapolate some information, and then briefly talking about the reserve requirement. So let's get started. So the Fractional Reserve System, it's the kind of uh, bank that we have today. Uh, it started back uh, in the 16th century. Now, what is it? It's the idea that only a portion of a check will deposit, so when you go and you put money into a bank, only a portion of that money is actually backed up by cash that's held in the bank vaults. The rest of the can be lent out. So again, only a fraction of the reserve, the cash in the bank, is actually in the bank. Most of it is actually outside of the bank, probably through a lending practice. Now, how did this start? Well, in the 16th century, travelers didn't really want to keep a whole bunch of gold in their persons. It wasn't exactly super safe to be traveling robbers are going after merchants all the time. Silk Road was a very dangerous place, for example. And so what we had, though, was a goldsmith guild, uh, kind of thing, a modern-day union type thing. And so they all had uh, signatures and placards and cards to verify, like receipts. And so these receipts said, yes, this traveler has X amount of gold in my vault, and they would sign off saying, yes, they're good for it. Well, those receipts became the first what we think of as paper currency. I'm not going to argue who came up with paper currency first, but this receipt was kind of an early version of the paper currency where it was backed by gold. We used that for quite a while. Goldsmiths started issuing receipts for even if they didn't exactly have gold because what they found is nobody came looking for the gold. And these uh, goldsmiths would start uh, charging interest uh, to have access to this, again, an early banking system because people weren't looking for this. Now, lesson learned the hard way, at some point people did start asking for their gold and the goldsmiths figured out they didn't have all of it. And so people got mad and they went 16th century on them. And so now we have it as a good rule and guideline. So significance. Uh, well, banks can create money through the lending practice. Even though the goldsmiths didn't have the gold, everybody believed that they did when they got the receipt saying, yes, they have some gold dust or bricks or whatever else once flakes that they believed it was because they thought the receipt was as good as gold. Well, banks can also create money. If people think it's worth that amount, then why isn't? It's acceptable, it's legal, it's generally used, has medium exchange, has a store of value, so banks can lend money into existence. How do I know that? Because we have a borrowing system and people use it, and I can go and buy that soda for that $1, even though there might not be any gold to back it, and at this point, there is no gold to back it. So money was created when loans were created even though there was no gold back in the 16th century, there was no gold to back it. Money was created. The amount of gold thought needed to back was held in reserve. Again, that's now what we call the reserve requirement because it is required. And that is set by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. And so we have currency reserves, which is the amount of money banks feel obligated, required, to now keep on hand. Second significance, and we don't get this anymore because of insurance from the Federal uh, from the uh, Federal Reserve, is that banks were vulnerable to panics and runs. If people started running towards banks and saying, "I need my money, I can't my mo get my money out," the reason is 
those banks were overextended. They didn't actually have all the money that people thought they did have because they lent it out to other people who then borrowed money. And so now you're borrowing somebody else's money. The bank simply has it on hand. So this became a bigger and bigger issue. This is why the Federal Reserve lends out $150 million per day, like we said in the last video. Because banks can't meet that obligation, so they have to borrow for just one night until they can. So next we're going to talk about a bank's balance sheet, sometimes referred to as a T-chart. So a bank's balance sheet or any business's balance sheet is a statement of assets and claims on assets that summarize the financial position of the bank at a certain time. So there's a couple parts to this. One is the value of assets must equal the amount of claims against those. So we have three things. We have liabilities, we have net worth, and we have assets. So the liabilities is the claims of non-owners against the firm's assets. We have the net worth, which is the claims of the owners, the firms against firms' assets. And then we have the actual assets. So here's kind of how I like to break it down. The assets are stuff that is in the bank. Okay, these are going to be things like, hey, we have cash. Uh, we own the property. It is an asset to the bank itself or whatever business you're referring to. Liabilities are things that the, I'll just say keep using bank, the bank owes to someone else. They are not affiliated with that. And so the most common liability we're going to have are going to be the checkable deposits. This is the idea that you have this person here and they're going to take their money and they're going to put it into the bank. This money still belongs to this person. The bank is simply holding on to it and they are liable. They're responsible for this. So that if this person ever comes asking for it, this belongs to them. It's simply being held in the bank. And so this is a liability. Net worth, the most common thing, or actually the only thing we're going to see, are going to be things like stocks. It is somebody owns a part of the bank itself. They own the stock in that. Now, why is this important? Just like this is cash that's in the bank, stocks are somebody paid money for the stock. So the person gets a stock in exchange. Yay, here's the person over here. And now the bank has the cash. Now, what's important about this? Well, if this person comes asking, the liabilities person comes asking for their money back, the bank is liable to give it back. If I go and say, hey, Bank of America, I have some of your stock, please give me my money back, they're under no obligation to return it. So here's the significance. Reserve requirements are only for liabilities because they can come ask for their money back. Those gold people can say, hey, I want my gold back, and they had to oblige that. Net worth, I don't have to. It's essentially now theirs in exchange for equity and ownership of the company. So here's just an example balance sheet. Uh, and so we can see things like, hey, here's the cash on hand. Here's the accounts receivable. Somebody owes me this amount of money. I own inventory. I own the equipment. And the other side, it's I am liable, I have to pay somebody this amount. So accounts uh, payable, I have to pay my taxes. I have a loan out. So I have that money, it's accessible to me, but actually belongs to somebody else or long-term loans or credit cards. And you can see the owner's equity is, hey, I uh, own some capital. They retain some earnings. So that'd be, uh, again, not a bank necessarily would see stocks, but what else do you see? The total value of liabilities and equity, equities what we call net worth, is equal to that of the assets. So you can see the equation down below, assets equals liabilities plus net worth. We'll be using that, so go ahead and write that down. So creating a bank. Now the numbers I'm using are from the 17th edition McConnell Brew textbook. So if you ever want to go back, you can look at that example.
So first off, a person's going to decide to start a bank. They get a charter if it's for a state, if they go with if they do bank in multiple states, if they get a national charter, great, you applied. Somebody said, good job, and that's great. Now I have the license to be a bank, but I have no money. Well, somebody says, I think you're going to do good things. So they're going to give me $200,000, and I'm going to sell them some ownership. So I'm going to sell this person some stock. So that's going to be net worth. I'm going to put a little net worth here, and that's because I sold them stock, and so there's my $200,000. Now, whatever happens over here, what's that mean? I now have cash equal to $200,000, because whatever's on the left side needs to be equal to whatever's on the right-hand side. Somebody put cash in the bank now has it equal and access to it on their asset side. Okay, property and equipment. Okay, so land equipment's gonna be bought, I'm gonna be buying some money. So we had $200,000 of cash, what we can also call reserves, and I had the $200,000 and that was from the stocks sale so what do i do well i went ahead and i bought some property because usually when people want a bank they want like a vault and those kinds of things so what i do i use some of this two hundred thousand dollars and i bought some property for apparently a hundred and ninety thousand dollars and then i still had some money left over of ten thousand dollars so this is all gone and got replaced by all this what happened the right hand side nothing 190 plus 10 equals two hundred thousand stock two hundred thousand dollars i simply reallocated what belongs to in this case the bank it is an asset to me i had cash on hand and i spent it which is probably what the intention of this stock was for anyways Okay, now we're going to start accepting some money. So deposits are made. So before we had the $200,000 in stocks, let's just assume that that had already happened. So then somebody's going to deposit $50,000. So they deposit on this side. Now again, that's going to be a liability because again, this money doesn't belong to me. It belongs to somebody else. So I just put CD for check will deposit $50,000 thousand dollars and again whatever happens to the right hand side also happens to the left hand side so I can go and put reserves or cash on hand those are interchangeable fifty thousand dollars if we'd have the old numbers on here these numbers will be added to the property that had been the hundred ninety thousand plus the other cash which was the ten thousand and here's the stock of the two hundred thousand so on the net worth liability side fifty plus two hundred two hundred and fifty thousand fifty plus one ninety plus ten is going to be two hundred and fifty thousand yes yes i'm still balanced i'm still good I didn't miss anything. So again, this is a way of checking to see, did something go awry? Uh, are you missing something or whatever else it might be? So quick question, what happened to the public's money? What's happened to the money supply? Well, as of right now, it's decreased by $50,000. Why? It's no longer accessible to them. They'd have to go to the bank to get to it. And so as more people put money into check -all deposits and savings accounts, that does decrease the money supply until loans are made, but we are not there yet. So this is where the whole reserve requirement plays a role. Again, uh, Goldsmith's family should keep some amount on hand. So the required reserve is the amount of funds equal to a specified percentage of the bank's own deposit liabilities against only on liabilities. So this is the percent that must be kept 
on, in cash or in reserve on the bank's asset side no matter what at all times and we're going to assume they'll keep the exact amount on in their vault so reserve ratio or required reserve uh, you'll hear different than once it's pretty much all the same thing just as a fraction or decimal or percent the ratio of the required reserves the commercial bank must keep to the bank's own outstanding checkable liabilities so you can see the equation down here the reserve ratio is the commercial bank's required reserves dollar value divide by the uh, bank's total liabilities again not net worth and liabilities only liabilities and for us that's going to be exclusively to checkable deposits now impacts the reserve ratio again you can see here um out of the checkable deposits about 44 at the time of this uh, of all money all m1 money was actual checkable deposits. The other 56% was loaned into existence. So majority of the money is actually backed by the promise of the loan to be paid off. So what's a really quick takeaway from this? Money is loaned into existence like we said before. So let's say we have a one-fifth reserve ratio, 20%. Okay, the fraction reserve system can change this and can uh, do different things with this. So let's kind of look at what just, how much is there in excess, how much can be loaned out, and what just happened. So we had had checkable deposits of $200,000. Okay, that's going to be the checkable deposits. Stocks are going to be one hundred thousand dollars we're going to assume the property is a hundred thousand dollars why do we do that it's part of just how the questions work out the reason why is then this is canceled out by this so really we're focused on the checkle deposits so if somebody deposited two hundred thousand dollars that means that there is cash of two hundred thousand dollars available so the reserve requirement is one tenth ten percent how much do they need to keep on hand? Well, 200,000, this would be my liabilities, times the required reserve, in this case, one-tenth, means they need to keep $20,000 on hand, what we call these required reserves. So I'm gonna do the equations actual reserves, which is my $200,000 of cash or reserves minus required reserves, that $20,000 we just found, equals excess reserves. Excess reserves is the amount that can be lent into existence, that can be lent out. And we'll assume it's a hundred percent each time. So they can lend out $180,000. Now, are they at this point? No, this would be the excess reserves. And this is a part of this cash on hand, but eventually that money could be lent out into existence. And then we have a new loan and that loan can then be spent because it's a medium of exchange and it's money. It's acceptable legal currency. And then we keep going from there, but that's going to get ahead of ourselves. So you can see the 10%, then you keep the $20,000 on hand. So we're going to do a little practice now. If you do want more on the um, T charts, you can definitely go to this QR code. And it's a, a video from a guy uh, that does a good job. Uh, until next time, bye.